Hello and welcome to his Drop and Get the Movies. I'm Mike. And I'm Jose. And uh, you join us on the 6th of November, so there are fireworks going on outside. Yes, lovely um, fireworks. So if you hear the explosions and stuff, don't you worry. People are just celebrating the um, the foiling of the gunpowder plot. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, and today we've been watching The Garden of the Finzi Contini's, which is a, <laughs> there you go. Yes. Which is a 1970 Italian film directed by Vittorio De Sica, who's best known for Bicycle Thieves... Umberto D, uh, Shoeshine, Miracle in Milan, which I love. A whole bunch of classic neorealist films from the immediate post-war period. Yeah, and uh, this film is 25 years after the war's finished. So this is 1970, and it's based on a novel of the same name by Giorgio Bassani from 1962. And is the novel autobiographical, do we know? Is he the, the Alberto figure? Oh, I don't know. He is from the region. He's from Bologna. Here we are. I'll just look at his Wikipedia. Bassani was born in Bologna into a prosperous Jewish family of Ferrara, which is what the film follows. Yes. So it sounds um, reasonably inspired by real life, if not directly autobiographical. Yeah. Um, he certainly knows what he's writing about, I think. Okay, so good. the film follows a group of Jews in Italy, in, in northern Italy, as I say, in this area, Ferrara, which is in Emilia-Romagna, yeah. in 1938, when the racial laws have just come in, in yeah. Italy, which segregates... Uh, the Jewish population. Yes. This very well-to-do family have a bloody great big house, a walled garden, a tennis court, and they host tennis tournaments and tennis gatherings there because the other clubs have all closed down for Jews now. That's right. So basically, it's a stately home. What's extraordinary about it is that it's in the middle of the city. These racial laws mean that uh, Jews can no longer be part of the tennis club, so they invite the more prosperous people like them to play tennis in their own private tennis court inside uh, the garden. Mm. And it's not just Jews that they invite. They, they seem to have a kind of real open-door policy to people who want to come. There are non-Jews yes. there. There are socialists. Um, but, you know, the, a lot of the people there are Jews, and it's a place for them to commune and convene. There's a uh, kind of historical love story going on between a couple of the characters. Um, the girl of the mansion, Mikol, uh, has has had this ongoing friendship with Giorgio, who is the son of a nearby family. The dad of his family works for the, the party, um, and he's getting his degree, and they've been very close for a long time, but he is really in love with her. Mm. And you see in these flashbacks, which I think are wonderful, how she really kind of seems to see him as like a younger brother. Yes. You know, so there's this um, miscommunication between them that's sort of unspoken, if you like, as to how they feel about each other. Mm. There's also the the tall, dark, handsome one, Fabio Testi, uh, who is uh, non-Jewish, but he's involved in this group, and he is the kind of swarthy stranger in some respects that gets in the middle of their um, non <laughs> non love yes. sort of partnership, and a, and a triangle kind of develops. But really, I kind of found the love stuff. Um, a bit banal. What I found most interesting is the background of rising fascism to the whole thing. Well, I, I mean, I love the whole thing. And, you know, I mean, when it's finished and, you know, I said, oh, so lovely. And you, think, and you said, lovely? Because, <laughs> <Like, Yeah. laughs> of course, it is kind of the wrong word. But what I meant by that is that it's so beautiful and moving, mm. right? Uh, and it kind of, it earns the emotion that it elicits from the viewer, right? So, you know, on the one hand, it's a very simple film. It's a film about, you know, people from the same milieu, but not really. So, you know, she is very wealthy. He is a middle-class professional. Yeah, well-to-do, but, you know, part of the differences between them is that, you know, in normal times they wouldn't even kind of think about getting together. But these are extraordinary times. So, you know, so they're both Jewish. They share a culture. They share both, you know, a Jewish culture. Yeah, kind of, uh, uh, they are culturally assimilated, but they are practitioners. Yeah, they, 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 they practice their faith. Mm. Um, so, so they have a lot in common, yet they're also kind of, you know, divided by class. 
right? Um, but instead of these extraordinary circumstances bringing them together, it brings them even further apart, right? And so you get this kind of honey-colored view of, you know, this magical world that is on the verge of being extinguished by unspeakable brutality, right? So, so there's something that is both lovely and that kind of, it's almost like you've got your heart in your throat because you're just waiting for terrible things to happen, right? Mm. And, um, and the film doesn't knock you over the head with them, really. The film is very gentle mm. in the way, you know, that it leads to this end, which is, you know, it's almost like the film, in a way, makes you understand, or a little bit at least, why people did nothing. So I kept saying, why don't they run? <laughs> right, like, you know. Oh, no, I totally get it. I think that's the best thing about the film. Yeah. It really strikes me. It's funny, because I mentioned a film recently that I'd quite like to watch, um, which is a 1924 uh, Austrian expressionist film called The City Without Jews. Mm. Um, and it's a kind of satire, from what I understand, about a place that passes laws to expel Jews, and then everything kind of goes well, or people are happy with it, all that kind of stuff, and then, then it goes badly. Um but what really... I haven't watched that yet, but what really strikes me is the titles, right? This is the Garden of the Fifty Continues. That's a city without Jews. There's this thing about space in there, and these are spaces... Cities and gardens are spaces with boundaries. Yes. And the idea of inclusion and exclusion is who's allowed and who's not is mm. kind of implicit in both of those ideas, I think. Yes. So, you know, the city expels the Jews, and this garden is a... Uh, it it uh, insulates... The Jews. Yeah. When you're Let inside, me... when you're inside this garden, you feel insulated from, like I said, the rising fascism outside. You understand why these people don't feel the urge to leave, don't see what's going on. Mm. Let me riff on that idea because I think that's a, a brilliant point. So you know what happens in the film is not just that they show you that. So you know the garden of the Fitzcontinues is like this uh, safe space, yeah. Um, but the thing is that it begins to be less and less safe as the city becomes more and more dangerous. And there are moments where, you know, the seeker shows you that in a way that is like, you know, almost instantly physically kind of um, uh, uh, understandable. Right. So there are two scenes. The, the one scene where he's on his bike and he encounters a fascist parade coming his way. Mm. Right. And you instantly feel that the danger that he's in, that the city's no longer his, yeah, that, mm. you know, riding a bicycle is now a danger. The scene in the cinema, yeah, where he tells, he speaks against Hitler on the screen, and then he's told, you, you're lucky they don't know that you're a Jew, right? So actually, you know, so long as they don't know he's a Jew, he's he can move through spaces, yeah, but as soon as, yeah, the knowledge is there, he can't. And then there's the other scene where, you know, he's passed this fascist parade yeah and he takes the key to get home and you could see that he's desperate to be inside his own house yeah mm. that inside his own house he's safe but until the door closes yeah he's vulnerable to whatever yeah i the city is no longer his it's a, it is a city without jews right mm. like uh or it's a city where jews don't have a right to be there anymore yeah even though there are jews there uh and i think the film communicates not only that those incidents but actually the progression of them yeah how you know you know in the beginning kind of they're moving through these spaces even if it's to go to that garden yeah and then kind of you know he's expulsed from the university he's got to use the the finzi contini's library and then you know he's afraid to walk down the street yeah like mm. um it's i think the film is does that magnificently. Yeah, to the point where, and this is a spoiler technically, but the film is 50 years old. Hmm. Um, at the end of the film, the Finzi Contini's are taken to a concentration camp. Yes. Um, a number of characters have uh, died. Um, I, I think what, one of the things I did like about the love story um, is that it, it's clearly kind of doomed. You know, I think you kind of feel that. Well, maybe you don't feel it right from the start, but you start to feel it. But it's doomed not just because the wrong characters fall in love or, you know, the love is kind of um, uh, unrequited and that sort of thing. But it's because, like, literally they can't withstand the pressures of the fascism going on outside and characters literally die because of it and, and they're caught up in it too. Like, I know, but there's something... So, for example, I, I, 
I admit, like, to me there was a difference between the middle class family and the aristocratic family, right? So the middle class family, I mean, it sent one child up to France, right? Like, you know, there is a kind of a planning of possible escape routes, even though there's an unwillingness and an attachment and there are feelings and yeah, you do understand why it's so difficult to leave. Mm. But, you know, with Nicole, I didn't understand that at all, you know, because, you know, on the one hand, both she and her brother only feel safe in that space. And actually, initially, that was because of their wealth. Yeah. The kind of everywhere they went, people looked at them and talked about them and so on. And they felt uncomfortable. Right. Mm. There's, a again, a beautiful little scene where you, you're shown them as children and someone says you can instantly tell which are the private. Yeah. Which which people pay privately. Mm. Yeah. And it shows them. Right. So they are the object of discussion and so on. So you can understand why, you know, they want to feel protected in that. But then she goes to school in Venice. She gets her degree in Venice. Mm -hmm. And she takes on as a lover, you know, a kind of a a proletariat communist, right? Mm -hmm. So she's not afraid of life, right? So why doesn't she leave, right? Like, Mm. I I don't understand that. They're wealthy. They've got money. They see it coming, right? Like, because this is not the first year. We're not speaking now of 1939. Yeah, kind of. Yeah, no, this film has moved on. Yeah, it's 42 or... I mean, I don't know well, when... 43 is when... So Mussolini was deposed in 43. And then a couple of months later, in September, the Germans occupied the country and released him from prison and installed him as a puppet leader. Right. And that's when concentration camps were installed in Italy. Right. Okay. So when they're being taken away at the end, has to be 43 or 44. 43. Or something like so that. it's five years after the film started, right? Yeah. Where you see all this progression of events. So, for example, I very much understood the father of the middle class family remaining yeah mm. you know because somebody's got to look after the house and the business and you know the house and the business is what's making everybody else's life abroad possible or the going abroad possible right mm. so you can understand why he might end up there you can also understand why the older finzi continis you know mm. might not want to go anywhere else no matter what happens right mm. um but the girl but the girl yeah it doesn't make sense to me yeah, I mean, I guess the film, it has something about the kind of, um, like the frog boiling in the pot yeah. sort of thing of it creeping up on you without you realising. But as you said, she does kind of notice it. It's funny, we think when we were watching the news just before, I was thinking about that because you were saying about this is what, uh, so the election is, well, the election is happening at the moment in the United States. The count is still happening in a few states. And, um, and Trump yesterday evening in America came out and spouted 15 minutes worth of just the most ridiculous lies and you and they were looking at it on the news today and you were saying I can't believe that no one is like reacting to this more more you know yes. how how normalized this has become and so on and that's kind of what was making me think like you're right like in, in your youth this would have been the most ridiculous scandal and just absolutely unheard of we've had this boiling pot thing going on here too to make this more normal mm. you know and I think and it kind of speaks to I think what the film shows kind of speaks to that too like I mean really what the film's huge, the film's major strength for me is how it shows people's inertia and um, not reluctance to change but but ignorance to what is even happening at, or refusal to see the signs so when the son goes to France with his brother to see his brother mm. And there's a character there uh, who was in a concentration camp. He was in Dachau as a socialist. Yeah, he was in Dachau. So, and he managed to escape. I mean, actually, I didn't know how realistic that was really. I thought, is that realistic? Because the idea is he escaped by saying that he had become a Nazi. Yes. And that felt very unrealistic to me. Um, but, but I thought, well, actually, it's serving a plot function here. Because it's, the whole point is, the kid who's come from Italy is being confronted for the first time with someone who was actually there yes. and has seen this. So, like, it makes... But, it has a function. But also, and I, I, I really don't know, Yeah. but, you know, kind of, let's say the Dachau uh, originated in 1936 or something. You know, there would probably be a difference between Dachau in 36 or 35 or whenever it was True. started and Dachau in 44. Yeah. So, I mean... Um, yeah. But he's still tattooed, isn't he? I mean, again, as to how much of it is a 
um, anachronism and when exactly things came in, you don't know. But but as for what you're being shown in the film, he's tattooed on his arm and he says, you know, we are being treated as as objects, as things to be labelled or whatever. Um, that house started in 1933 right. and it was initially intended to hold political prisoners. So actually okay. it completely makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but still, the idea that he got out by claiming to be a Nazi now is that's what that's what I found you know kind of um a little difficult to swallow but that may just be ignorance maybe that really did happen the point is I did let it go because I thought the function it was it was fulfilling in the film which was to confront this kid who was isolated from what's really happening with someone who is actually there was a useful function yes well actually the thing is it's not just that kid it's all of them yeah right you know because um and I think it's I think what the film does well also is um, make me at least understand, right? So you know the whole thing about oppression of the Jews in Europe is that there were cycles of it, right? So you can also understand how a Jewish family in Italy in 1938 could say, okay, you know this is just another bad cycle. You know, there will be like uh, mm. a pogrom or something somewhere and then kind of it'll all go away. And yeah, mm. I mean, because also, you know, these extermination camps, that was completely unprecedented. And, you know, yeah. Uh, um, so so I think that kind of so you can imagine all of these students. Yeah, kind of in Grenoble thinking this is terrible you know, but it's just another bad patch that we're going through, right? Kind of things will change. Actually, you know, not that different than a lot of this, these discussions around Trump. Yeah. Right? Everything, everything will get back to normal, right? Mm. You know. Do you think the film would have been better for um, making that more explicit? You know, because it sounds like a reading that you're really putting onto the film from from your own experience or own ideas. It, I, I'm not sure that's hugely supported by what the film really shows. Well, I, I'm, I mean, I'm not sure, right? But the yeah. thing is, you know, we were discussing this earlier. The film is just made, like, 25 years after the end of the war. Mm-hmm. All of these things would have been fresh in people's minds, mm-hmm. you know? I mean, I was thinking, for example, of, you know, Pauline Kael, who reviewed the film, and I read her review, you know? I mean, she was 20 in... 1933 yeah Mm. she would have been familiar both with everything that led up to it you know and everything that happened in the war and she was probably still only in her early 50s at the time that she wrote this review Mm. right well not even in her late 40s yeah so i that the context that we maybe feel is missing today is implicit at the time yes that's what that would be my argument yeah Yeah. the kind of people would have known this stuff yeah that it would have been fresh in people's minds. In fact, you know, like, you know, somebody Pauline Kell's age would have had a boyfriend who'd fought in Italy or whatever. Yeah, like, I yeah. mean, this is all fresh. Yeah. yeah. So, so I, I mean, I suppose I am reading into it in the sense that you, you know, with movies, you always bring all you know to your understanding of it. But I think there are things, you know, the film, I mean, you know, my feeling also is that films are like poetry or something. Yes. You know, you don't, tell everything mm. you're not writing a thesis yeah but kind of you can note you suggest you kind of make a metaphor of something and i think all of those things are do lend support to my interpretation yeah, yeah. um so and the film begins with that actually you know the first discussion when the boy comes uh from his first tennis match at the finzi contini's is the father saying oh you know kind of these people they you know kind of now that they're changing the laws you know, they just want to protect us and lord it over us, right? That They think mm. that that's what's going to happen, yeah? That, like, you know, they'll be restricted for a while and then kind of, you know, that, that will just give one more opportunity for the Finzi Concinis to, yeah, make themselves higher than they are. Mm. And the son tells him, you know, no, kind of, uh, you know, you're always making excuses. You keep quiet. You, you adjust. You know, you collaborate, right? Until it happens to us. I, so it is kind of really telling you this thing you know what is that poem about I kept quiet about this I kept quiet about that and then they came for me right <laughs> I think that's how it goes <laughs> yeah but that whole dialogue between the father and the son is evoking what's expressed in that poem right yeah you know so and that's at the very beginning of the film you know they've kept quiet they've adjusted they've collaborated you know and now they're coming after them 
but even they don't know the extent to which they will be coming after them, you know, to the point yeah. of killing them, right? You know, so it's not just restrictions on business or on education, right? Um, so it's that progression that the film comes. And of course, at the end of it, the father, who thinks that the Finzi Contini's are just want, want to lord it over them, kind of, you know, they're brought to the same level, basically. You know, they're just kind of Jews going to a concentration camp, hoping to be able to stay together. Yeah. Which is like, uh, yeah, and actually that struck me, that bit where hopefully they won't separate. Yeah. You know, because, I mean, that again is a has been a very active um, sort of um, bit of, well, disgusting activity that the Trump administration has been doing in separating families that come mm. across the border. And this thing about hundreds of kids that they cannot find the families for. Yeah. Uh, disgusting um but it did also make me think of like, what you say about them all coming down being reduced to that same kind of thing um when, when i was sort of you know i don't know six or seven years ago feeling less jewish in a sense than i do now like i, I was i'm i'm i suppose the kind of context around well the world now has made me more um vocal mm. about how Jewish I am, mm. you know what I mean, or, or just being a Jew, yes. you know, which is not to say that I ever like wanted to hide it, but I was just like, eh, it's not really relevant. The whole, re- all the religious stuff never interested me, and that's what I really associated it with. It wasn't about being like afraid of being called a Jew by people or anything like that. Um, it was just about, you know, I don't really feel part of that community, but increasingly I feel like I have to, mm. you know. Um, and a, a family friend guy I know would always say, you know, you go up the same chimneys as everyone else. And I, increasingly, I kind of get what he means. Yes. You know, and that's kind of true here. It doesn't matter what your social standing is as a Jew in this part, in this time, you'll get sent up the same chimneys. Well, um, yeah, and, uh, you know, anti Semitism is on the rise and um, in kind of really shocking and unbelievable ways. So I think this is what makes the film kind of all the more um, touching. But I also want to say that the film is not only about that, right? It is about also about a young couple falling in love, but with other people instead of with each other. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Uh, or, you know. A love triangle. A really, love triangle, yeah. And, yeah, so an impossible kind of love. And it's, about, it's also about the pain of all of that. I mean, I really feel for the young boy. What was it? Uh, uh, Giorgio. Yes. Yeah. And actually, I love the bit of dialogue with the father, you know, where he says something like, in order to understand the world, you first have to die. Yeah. And it's better to die young so that you can recover from it. Mm. Yeah, and I thought that was a beautiful speech because, of course, there's this metaphoric death. There's this being crushed by life. And then there's a, there's a difference between being crushed by life and having your life extinguished. Yeah. Mm. being killed by other forces yeah having your life taken away so so there's the metaphoric extinction and there's the literal one and the film kind of deals with both yeah mm. that one scene in the cinema that you mentioned i did want more out of that scene i thought maybe this is just a very personal taste but i felt like it ended too quickly i wanted you know so it so the um giorgio and i forget the character's name but the um <clears throat> Fabio Testi is the actor who plays him. Yeah, the gentile the yeah. friend who is ends up in the relationship with the girl he loves. Um, they go to the cinema together and they see this uh, footage of uh, Nazi goose-stepping and Hitler. Well, Giorgio appears to be the only Jew in the cinema. Malnate. Is, Malnate is a character, yeah. yeah. So Giorgio appears to be the only Jew in the cinema and he speaks up and he says these clowns and he you know, basically shouts at Hitler on the screen... And a couple of guys in front turn around and say, oh, fuck off, you dirty Jew. And they kind of start the fight. And then it cuts to outside, they're walking away. And Manate says, you're lucky they didn't know you're actually Jewish. Yes. You know? um, but like, I felt like I wanted more. I, I, I don't know, maybe, I've just, maybe that's just a very personal thing. I wanted more of the fight in that scene. It felt like it well, ended too quickly. I wanted the, the conflict. Well, let me tell you what I understood by that. right? Because what I understood by that is that Malnate who is a communist and who is of a working class background or, yeah, certainly uh, uh, not of Giorgio's own background. Yeah, he's of a lower class. Um, 
is aware of all of the dangers in speaking in public. And actually, uh, what you get a sense is how, of how innocent Giorgio is. Yes, yeah. you do. So, um, you know, because one of the things that the film does, which I think is very, very clever, is he makes, the Sika makes all the Jews blonde and blue-eyed and beautiful and Aryan-looking and upper-class-looking and, yeah. Mm. So, you know, so so that is its own shield, yeah, and it's part of the same shield. It's what's been protecting all these people, yeah. They've been protected because they're wealthy, yeah. They have the right connections. They're friends with all the establishment. They're part of the tennis club and the chamber of commerce, and yeah. And actually, their looks, yeah, kind of, you know, they, yeah. There is a hierarchy, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, so kind of, you know, they're not dark and swarthy, yeah, they're kind of uh, blonde and, yeah, northern and all of that, you know, so that has been its own shield and that this is like an awakening. He doesn't even know in what kind of danger he's in. And then the guy says, you're lucky that they don't know that you really are a Jew, right? Yeah. Or else you wouldn't have gotten out. Yeah, so I think that lack of awareness, yeah, that, that sense of having been protected by kind of class and looks and culture. Yeah. Although I felt kind of like, um, I, I felt, I think the way um, that, you know, Asian people feel when Scarlett Johansson plays one of them. <laughs> <laughs> well, like these Aryans, how dare you play Jews? <laughs> well, but you, yeah, we don't know that. And actually, you know. No, I know. Kind of, I just, but, uh, but I thought, but when you pointed, uh, actually, it wasn't that you pointed out, it's that when the film began and these guys have blonde hair and blue eyes, I thought Jose will be noticing this because you always well. do. And then I thought, yeah, it's interesting that these that these Jewish characters have this very Aryan well, look to them. It's one of the things that's always oppressed me. I mean, you know, you grew up in North America, and actually, it's it's really uncanny, right? Like, a kind of, you know, everyone who's meant to be beautiful is always, like, blonde and blue-eyed and, like, looks like, you know, Barbie and Ken or whatever, right? Like, mm. you know, so, you know, if you're short and Hispanic and whatever, it's it's almost like, or, or people have written tons about this, if you're black, right? Like, kind of... You know, it's almost like you're not beautiful. You can't be attractive, or yeah, like all the norms. So you know, these things affect you. So of course you notice, uh, and of course in this film it becomes a deliberate kind of uh, aesthetic strategy. It's something that has obviously been designed, yeah, to mm. have kind of, you know, all these young Jews, yeah, be so blonde and blue-eyed and all beautiful and so on, right? Like you know, yeah. I mean, beautiful is the wrong word because, of course, there's many kinds of beauty and, you know, kind of John Garfield is beautiful, you know, but John Garfield looks Jewish, right? I mean, he's he's short and swarthy and he's often, he often played them in the movies, right? Like Body and Soul, right? I mean, so, so this is a deliberate strategy to kind of play with, you know, social expectations of representation and not just in terms of the protagonist, but in terms of everybody, right? Like... Mm. You know, so it's everybody playing tennis and yeah, yeah, kind of uh, 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 in that garden looks a particular way. Um, yeah. So anyway, I thought it was beautiful. And then the thing is, you know, the film kind of creeps up on you, right? It has, you know, so Nicole's brother was played by Helmut Berger, right? And who's clearly gay in the film. Yeah, and it's it's not yeah. sad. Well. It is dramatized, isn't it? His... Uh, well, I, I noticed the kind of hands and close-ups between him and Malnati. Uh, Malnati, yeah. Um, early on, when they're chatting at the tennis club in first, basically the first scene. Yes. I think you notice it there, and then you're just kind of cued in to keep looking at yeah. that afterwards. And, yeah. uh, but he dies of consumption, doesn't he? So, mm. um, so, you know, all these people are doomed in different ways, and kind of life laughs at them because, you know the virile communist <laughs> who's played by Fabio Testi, you know, the only thing that he hopes for, yeah, is that he's not sent to fight in Russia. Of course, where does he die? In Russia. Yeah, <laughs> at the front. <clears throat> so, um, the film has this beautiful, gentle, elegiac tone, which kind of brings out the value of civility and culture and gentleness and all of those things that the Nazis will destroy. Yeah, and it ends with the this footage of the kind of kind of, kind of destroyed and empty city and garden. Yes. With the final image of the the 
empty tennis court now, and over it is this Jewish um, kind of poem. It's a poem that's sung, or poem slash song, that's recited um, for the dead, um, called um, El Malay Rakamim. And very more. I mean, I don't know the words, I don't know that, but it, you, know, you, you feel you feel it in the tone, in the quality of the voice that's singing it. You know, the kind of mournful sense over the ending of the film. Yeah, it was so beautiful. I mean, it almost made me cry. But for me, it started before that. It's when, when the grandmother, yeah, almost like her face crumples up, and she she begins to cry and puts her head on her granddaughter's shoulder. I thought, oh my <laughs> god, you know, mm. it's like. Because, of course, so much is expressed in that image, right? She's looking for help and succor and, you know, and the granddaughter is like, embraces her, you know, and embraces her with this magnificent diamond ring that she's wearing and so on. And you think, well, you know, you won't be able to protect yourself, much less your grandmother. Your ring will not be able to protect you like you know what's coming, right? Mm. You know, so all of these really human kind of relationships of this this old frail woman wanting to find comfort and the granddaughter who's tall and strong wanting to comfort her and you just know that it'll all be for naught you know that there will be no comfort yeah mm. but you know this kind of beautiful image of like this yeah this emotion you know in the face of what will come and I thought it was like ah and it makes me think that you know you couldn't imagine this of an American film at all. American film would have to end with with uh, a solution or hope or something like that. You know. This... Well, actually, there's that wonderful video essay called "What Is Neo Realism" by Kogonada. Okay. You know, which takes at the Sika film. It's called "Indiscretions of an American Wife." Yeah, it's um, with Montgomery Cliff and Jennifer Jones, uh, produced by David Selznick. But there was an Italian version called Stazione Termini and the American version, yeah, Indiscretions of an American Wife. And what he does is to show you the difference between the Italian version and the American version to explain mm -hmm. neorealism. And that was exactly the difference. That in an American film, everything that isn't action, that doesn't advance the plot, gets cut. Mm. Right? I remember this. I saw this with you. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So, you know... So, so I thought that film explained it very well, and that's what you see here, right? Because the power in uh, the Seekers films comes from incident, yeah, from things that seem to trail in, you know, yeah, that are seemingly insignificant. So in that film, you know, all the peasants waiting for the train and having conversations, and yeah, you get you get the sense of a whole way of life through those incidents, and it's not just yeah, moving to the next plot point, right? Mm. You know, because as soon as the police come to the house, you know what the story is going to be. You know, mm -hmm. like, you, so there are a couple of things that are added. Seeing the father mm -hmm. yeah, and being told about, you know, Giorgio. Um, but you could argue that that whole last scene is completely extraneous. Yet, you know, so much is said. Yeah. The way the servants look at their masters being rounded up by the police. You know, the way that uh, the authorities make them wait and then line them up like school children. Yeah, the way the family separated, yeah, this this kind of embrace, yeah. Yeah, so much is being said that mm -hmm. isn't actually action. Yeah. 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 So so anyway, I thought it was very, very beautiful. Mm. Very sensitively kind of put together and yeah. dramatized. Uh, and you pointed out that this is the third Academy Award winner winner for best foreign film in a row that we've seen and have now covered for eavesdropping. Yeah, so we saw that, and the others are a while ago, so we saw um, Z, yes. or Z, Costa Gavras, that won in 1969, and then in 1970, Investigation of a Citizen Above Suspicion, Elio Petri, yes. or Elio Petri, and then 71, this one. The Garden of the Finns, and they're, and they're all films that, that are about totalitarianism, fascism, yes. state control, the, the kind of... Uh, Kafkaesque sort of situations that, that humans are put in. So there were discussions that cinema was having with its various audiences in the late 60s and early 70s that we should be having now. Yeah, 50 years on. Yes. 50 years ago. I mean, pointed out, like I say, this is, 
25 years after the end of the war, but 50 years away from us Yes. now. Like, it's kind of... The history is getting further away. Yeah, so the film us. was made 25 years after the events depicted, but we are seeing the film 50 years after the film was first released. Yeah. So, like, it's... it's even though, So it's a film that has this historical perspective on what it's showing, yes. but actually our historical perspective on the film is even further from it. It's twice as yeah. far, yeah. I don't so. know. It's a funny thing to think about. Yes. Anyway, we are eavesdropping at the movies, and we are on... Apple Podcasts, uh, Google Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, and YouTube. Uh, on social media, we're on Facebook and Twitter. And the website is eavesdroppingatthemovies.com. Yes, and we highly recommend that you see it. Mm. And we should say that we covered this because it's being shown, uh, it's being streamed online for the UK Jewish Film Festival yes. uh, on Sunday. So if you listen to this after Sunday the 8th of November 2020, you will have missed that, but it's still available. Yes. You should see it. And the, um, the UK Jewish Film Festival is going on until the 19th of November. Fantastic. Thank you. That was the reason for doing it and I'd forgotten. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Bye-bye. <laughs>